buffering, but it's taking its sweet time. Ah. So long to do things. Right. Still buffering. Hopefully it's getting better. Hopefully it is getting better. And then. Hmm. Sound appears to be working, video is working, it's been recording fine all day. What's up with you? What is the problem today, my little computer? Is this working? Is this working? Because I have no idea. Yes, for now. My sorry, apologies everyone, I have no idea what's up with the poor old computer, but it's having a real hizzy fit. Well, the internet doesn't seem to be working. Yep, yeah, the poor computer was, um... Well, everything was okay on the computer, I restarted the computer and did all that to try and get the computer to work. And for some reason... I'm going to have to sort of have a conversation at some point, but you know, All right now it's working. I can pop out the chat. I can say hello to everyone properly and I can answer some questions. I can't do the normal graphics I do because it just doesn't work now on in this form and I'm going to have to fix it. But you know, I'm thinking I'll, I'll fix it all. So, hello, Paul. Hello, Jerison. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, King's Rook. Hi, RF4. Hi, Brock Payne. Hi, Angus Asonal. Hi, Paul Johnson. Frederico Vago. Infodect. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, hi, John Shea. Hi, Greg Skarsky. Hi, Bijon. Hi, King's Rook. Hi, Thinking Community. Hello, everyone. Hi, Old Richard. Thank you. And Old Richard, thank you for becoming a patron. Um, hello everyone, basically. Hi, Nappy. Hello, hello, hello. Right then, I'm just going to quickly turn the phone around because I forgot to send the link to the new thing to one particular person. So it's just going there. And you can all see the big... That's the questions I have up in front of me, which is how I run it, I run these things. Right then, let's... It should be working. Mm -hmm. And if I go to YouTube quickly, sorry about this, everyone. But my poor girlfriend has been patiently on the other end of the phone. Sending me, uh, go, asking me if I'm okay, if there's anything she can do to help. So the least I can do is send her a link to the new one. Alright then. Hopefully...
that is now happy. And you can all see me. Audio is lagging behind the video. Getting back to installing my shelf over there. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everyone. Right then, audio is lagging behind the video. How much, King's Rook? Is it terrible or, you know... Bitch, I do. I have my gaming PC upstairs. But with all the dust and all the building that's been going on and everything else, even though I've now finished the book and everything's with publishers, basically my thing has been, I always said I'd get my game machine down once the book was in and everything was happy. When the publishers send me the okay and everything's happy, the gaming machine will come down and all this will be run off the gaming machine. Until then, it's the poor, poor... Um... Uh, laptop which has to deal with it all and usually it works okay hello golden eagle so you know <laughs> in fact being spanish i must say the uh, two intro the amada me Mess, Aru, very good. I sincerely hope you get a you get a great job. Come to Spain and improve your Spanish. Uh, yes, I'll probably help. That and listening to my poor girlfriend, who is far far better at uh, languages than I am. Right. So, the Armada, and it's one of those fun things. Luckily, I do have one advantage. I do have one advantage in this. I can start playing around with. Yes, I do. If I think about it. I have the questions, but I also have... If I can do this... And give myself a bit more wiggle room. Ah, sorry. battery uh, the cable for the laptop was buried beneath um iron brew bottles it happens but now if i open that up then whilst it's not going to be the usual thing i can have some pictures behind me Well, that though, it's better than nothing anyway. I can, to an extent, point them out. So. For me, the entire armada comes down to pretty much... The competing groups around Prince Philip, uh, uh, King Philip, and that's why it happens. The Armada is more about different groups wanting to try and have power and presence than it is about actually achieving the goals in some respects. Ever, I'd, uh, ever tried Iron Brew as official sponsor? That would be very, very tempting and very lovely, but I don't think they, uh, they haven't yet contacted me. So we can hope. We can hope for Iron Brew. Right, that should be better. So hopefully you can sort of see the screen, see the questions and see me. So we can chat now and I don't have to keep looking from behind the screen. Um... So, the Spanish Armada. <laughs> oh. It's one of those scenarios, the more I looked into the Spanish Armada, the more I kept coming across the um, Portuguese and the, uh, the Vasco da Gama. And basically, <sighs> there is a reason why the big squadron... The really critical units of the Armada are the Portuguese squadron. The Portuguese in many ways built up the far more fighting navy 
than the Spanish necessarily did, because the Spanish were involved in fighting the galley war, in fighting all sorts of scenarios inside the Mediterranean. The Portuguese were looking at a, you know, for them, galley warfare when you're on the Atlantic coast of the Iberian Peninsula. Okay, maybe the Romans did it, but it ain't that good. Uh, on the Armada subject, I think the major factor was the channel itself. It's an odd body of water. Contrary winds, very different currents. It takes experts over. There is that. It was a bigger food. And um, a very nice person pointed out in the comments that in the du in Netherlands, the Dutch teach that it was the Dutch who saved England and this, and with the Spanish Armada. And to an extent, they're right. Because if it hadn't been for the Dutch, then there would have been... The Duke of Palmer's army would have been completely free. But there again, if it hadn't been for the Dutch, then the Duke of Arm uh, fighting the Dutch, the Duke of Arm Palmer's army probably wouldn't have been in the Netherlands in the first place. Which might have meant they'd have brought more with them in the first place, but there, uh, there again, there's all sorts of problems. So it's a fun scenario. So, Thompson, I'm rusty on English history. Uh, was the Armada before or after the Wars of the Roses and Cromwell? Try and sort it. Uh, it goes Wars of the Roses, which were brought, bring the Tudors to power. And I haven't got my excellent book on Henry VII close to me, but I've got my excellent book on Henry VIII, but not my excellent book on Henry VII. I think it's it's down there in that box. Um, and then it goes Armada, the various wars of Spain, the loss of Calais by Queen Mary. You see, that's the other thing. She lost Calais, which is another one which is damning her. Not just Bloody Mary, she lost Calais. <sighs> Until then, we controlled a portion of France. We controlled Calais! Just imagine if we still controlled it to this day, the amount of people complaining. Anyway, leaving that to one side. Uh, you have all sorts of things going on. You have a really, really fun time going on. And this is it, basically. The Armada is a lot of people. A lot of people. Um, Kevin Glad, but I thought the Portuguese were English allies since 1373. They were apart from when they were taken over by Spain. Spain was rarely Britain's ally. As there was a great saying in point on where Britain has invade has at the same point invaded and allied with pretty much every nation in Europe, depending on which suited us. We do these things. Come on, is the defeat of the Spanish Armada, i.e., the most common perception, more myth, legend than fact, or is it one of the few historic events not to be affected by myth? It is hugely affected by myth. We're going to get into several of the myths in a second. But first of all, I want to start talking about this guy. Alvaro de Bazan, first Marquis of Santa Cruz. He's critical. If it hadn't been for him pushing Philip, if it hadn't been for his protestations and his arguments and his strong, strong making the case for it, it wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't happen at all. That the, the phone just made a noise. Not sure why, but the phone did just make a noise. So, thank you. If you're the reason the phone made a noise. Uh, right. Um, and to be honest, he's a good commander. He's a competent commander. So is... Medina Sidonia, but Medina Sidonia is a competent land forces commander. Santa Cruz is a competent naval forces commander. He managed to carry off the Azores, which everyone says, oh, that was going to be impossible. Myself, looking at the command structure in the Azores, he wasn't actually fighting that much of an impossibility. But leaving that to one side, he managed to persuade Philip to sponsor him and do it, uh, sponsor this campaign. But Philip's really not that keen on it in many respects, and it costs a lot of money, and Philip keeps going bankrupt. The man is considered by his father to be a savant, a, a, a great young leader, but he keeps making his country go bankrupt. 
Admittedly, it helps when your creditors can't do anything to you, because if they advance on you, you just send the army to kill them. But... Oh, new subscriber. Thank you to whoever my new subscriber was, then. Um, I do... Thank you to all new subscribers, but as I said in the introductions, this is now for at least the next two months, possibly the next three months. It depends when my lovely university, if the universities, you know, put in the contracts as they normally do. Um, YouTube is my primary income sort of stream. Now, I do have some savings and some money put aside and things and things, so don't go thinking I'm going to be destitute or anything like this. And as I said, I do have the advantage that I am rent free, although I contribute to the bills at home because mum's view is she paid the mortgage is being paid off. She's not going to charge her children rent. Which is very nice, considering both of us are at home. But... This is my book money. This is what's going to keep me in books. So thank you very much to all subscribers, everyone who likes, everyone who does the super chats, all those things. Thank you very much. And the patrons. You're all wonderful. Now... These are the other two officers involved. And these two are forgotten more often than not. The Duke of Parma, who is, how do I put it? The Netherlands, his role, he's kind of like the Viceroy of India. He pretty much is a government unto himself. This is the time when communications are really do take quite a long time. They are not that secure. He's pretty much is a head de facto head of state acting in on behalf of Philip. And honestly, he sometimes forgets that part of being on behalf of Philip. He always has a good reason. Always has a good reason for not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And then there is the deputy commander, Juan Martinez de Recolde. And frankly, he's the most experienced naval officer that Medina Sidonia has. Hence, he was selected by... Um, Santa Cruz as his deputy and the, between the two of them they managed to make the Armada as effective as they do but it isn't going to be great so let's answer the questions I'll get to the miss one in a second RF4. Did the Spanish royal household appreciate the logistical difficulties involved in trying to link forces, two forces hundreds of miles apart whilst passing through enemy waters? And to what extent it is, it, is what they, uh, the, to what extent is what they achieve a success? No, they didn't expect, they didn't understand at all. No. Um, God's providence was going to solve all the problems. God's providence. I always love the phrase that God helps best those who help themselves. Not those who go around going, I will do nothing and rely on God. God gives us the tools, we move forward with them. Mm -hmm. Thanks, King Rook. Uh, come, as soon as I have more hours of paid work, I'll try to su do a super chat every so often. Yeah. Look, we're all poor at the moment. If you can't afford it, don't worry. The, basically, the thing that I say is, whatever is said is very very nice don't feel you have to but uh, you know even watching the adverts is one of the things i've picked up being involved in youtube and since, especially since i've become uh doing the youtube myself uh, more stuff myself i now watch the adverts i skip them as soon as i can but i always watch them and i don't you know exit the program before uh, the video before the advert comes up because it really does help they all add up sadly enough um Seemed like replacements after Drake's Cadiz attack had to be very green lumber wise. Building ships takes assembly of proper wood and stored at least two years of soon. A factor? It certainly didn't make things easy, but honestly, they didn't replace that many ships lost. That was a big damage. They lost a lot of ships. I lost a lot of critical ships in the attack on Cadiz. You didn't. This man keeps spending his money. He doesn't have any money. He has Spain to run. Spain is not a good place to run. Um. How do I put this? I, I describe Spain as a nightmare uh, to run. It's a collection of competing bureaucracies more than governments. And honestly, it's terrible. Uh, 
And for some reason, Microsoft Word doesn't like the phrase bureaucracies. It likes only bureaucracy. No, no, no. And it also doesn't like Moriscos. But honestly, they're having a lot of trouble. And this is also one of the things which is mobilizing them to do launch the Armada because of the threat England is perceived as holding to their claims in the New World. They're not that secure. They're not that strong. They are dependent upon the, uh, the various special metals uh, coming from the New World, from South America, to keep their economy going. England is a threat to that. Even before it leaves the Catholic Church, once it leaves the Catholic Church, it, the Treaty of Tordes now has no binding effect on it at all. There is nothing doesn't care at all about it. So, you know, it's just fun. And then you have the various English personnel. Um, always remember, you have a whole list of different admirals. We always talk about Drake, but he's only the deputy commander. The commander is Howard of Effingham, and there is a third in command called Thomas or John Hawkins, who literally is the person who's built the Royal Navy, or the Navy as it exists then. He's pretty much designed and forced the ships. He's the one who's come up, or rather, not necessarily come up, but really pushed um, the racing galley, or Razzie galley. Galleon. And so... What I would say is this rather mirrors on what the, you had in the interwar period and for most of the Navy. You have the First Lord, who looks after strategy and global operations and politics. That's Howard Effingham, who's the Lord High Admiral. You have the Second Lord, Vice Admiral Sir Francis Drake, who looks after personnel. Great for recruiting. Come on, Drake is your brilliant recruiting tool. And you have your controller slash treasurer, who looks after the building and the procuring for the Navy. That's John Hawkins. The Royal Navy's already starting to start professionalise and organise and work out what it's going to be and what it's going to do. And this is because the Navy has to. The English have to because their Navy has to be different. It has to be able to counterbalance the advantage. Now here's the thing. Every time you hear about the Armada, you will hear about the 130 ships. That's the first myth. The, the Spanish fleet massively outnumbers the Royal Navy. Well, the English fleet. For starters, the English fleet is deploying roughly 200 ships. Yeah, that's 200 to 130, okay? Okay. I'm not sure which school of maths people who keep writing these books that say that the Spanish Armada massively outnumbered the English comes from, but is not the same one I did. Secondly, okay, so let's go down to a brass tax. Galleons versus galleons. Actual warships. Because let's be honest, most of those ships are store ships, small ships, all sorts of things wandering around. They are not warships for fighting. So the... Spanish to start off with 20 galleons, 4 galleys, and 4 galleases. They're Napoleon galleys with carry cannon. And um, are made up mostly of Urca, Carax, and Caravels. And other small craft. That's lovely. But those ships aren't going to do much fighting. In, reg in contrast, the English Royal Fleet has 21 galleons out of a total strength of 34 ships. And a further 30 galleon-sized vessels, of which 12 were acknowledged privateers owned by the fleet commanders, which meant they were private warships. They were galleons, uh, definitely. So your tightest structure, you could say, is the English were deploying 33 galleons to the um, Spanish eventual 19. 
30, which are odds which, let's be honest, Nelson would have loved at the Battle of the uh, Battle of Trafalgar, 33 to 20 to 19. Or you could think it, they have 51 to 19. Yeah. It's fun. And that's just part of this. We're going to get into the next myth, but I'm going to answer some questions first. And I'm going to check that I'm still on camera. Yeah, when it's a white screen, it really isn't that good for you. Let's see if that shows up better. Nope. No better at all. Okay. Well, I'll leave that for me. I, I, I'll, what I'll do is, if that's not going to work, I'm not going to shout that well. I will do this. And I'll just sit and chat. Because that's far easier then. So, honestly, the Spanish Armada is one of those scenarios where the myth is very much built up. It's the English foundation myth in many ways, but it's nowhere near as bleak as necessary it's portrayed and nowhere near as likely as a bigger problem. Albert's asking, but weren't those 200 ships spread over the whole coast not present all at one time? No. <laughs> the There are 55 ships based in... The 55 major ships are based in Plymouth. And the idea is they would catch up uh, with the fleet as it goes on. But there are more based along the coast. And those are mostly ships which are going to supply it. The heavy warships are in... Plymouth. The reason they're in Plymouth is because the English mounted a forward attack to try and go to intercept the Armada in the Bay of Biscay. That's how confident the English were of actually a fight. Okay? They were actually prepared to go forward and try and, in, 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 you know, try and intercept the Armada in the Bay of Biscay. They were, uh, Biscay. They were forced back. They go into the channel, into the Ply uh, Plymouth. Um... In Happy, do you think that some of the Henrik and Galleys, is A.G. the Bull and the Anne Galley, were an inspiration for the race-built galleons, race-built lines, single-deck main armor? I think to an extent they were, but also I think it was an analysis of what they were facing. I honestly think John Hawkins and Drake and Effingham probably had a discussion. And Hawkins is the architect who pushes this. And I think the discussion goes along lines of, we've got a problem. They've got more than us, and they're going to have more troops than us. You see, the sh thing is, the sheer number of tr ships that the Spanish brought with them would have overwhelmed the Royal Navy if they tried to fight a traditional sea battle at this time, which would be to clo uh, fire some uh, fire off a few rounds of shot. Uh, of cannon blasts and then close and try and board that would have massacred the royal navy because of the english fleet because it just couldn't have done, kept up with it it couldn't it didn't have enough ships each ship would have been swarmed and overrun it would have had a couple of ships trying to get all the it, it would have been the carracks the caravels all these things it just couldn't have managed it so how do you keep your enemy at range but still be able to manoeuvre to bombard them. Well, you need to be able to go faster than them. And everyone knows longer ships are faster. It's the length to beam ratio. And 
And you also know that right then, if I'm building it longer, I'm going to be less maneuverable unless I cut it down. Because only if I reduce and lower the weight, so reduce top weight and lower it down, then it will be uh, stay the same maneuverable, if not get more maneuverable. So that's why the English ships were actually longer and more maneuverable than their Spanish counterparts. Angus it takes three years to build a ship. It takes three months to build a YouTube channel. The live stream will continue. It does. Uh, Airman, wasn't Portugal owned by Spain this time? Yes, it was. If so, what was the, uh, the its role in Marta? Mar Mar they were providing ships. They provided the key, the key squadron. Uh, most of those key galleons come from the Portuguese squadron. Um, I have a list of ships of the Armada. It's one of the beautiful things I found on Wiki, uh, Wikipedia, actually. List of Armada ships. And there are some colleagues who probably wouldn't enjoy me using this, but mm, it works. Uh, the squadron of Portugal provided the San, Ma San Martin, San Joao, the San Marcos, the San Luis, San Philippe, San Matias, uh, San Tigo, uh, San Francisco, San Cristóbal, San Bernardo, Augusta, and Julia. And there are at least two of those which are a thousand tons. They are far bigger. Um, one of them was eventually burnt. Yeah, the um, Sao Joao was burnt at Corona by Sir Francis Drake in May 1589. But we'll leave that to one side. Um, quite a lot of them were wrecked off the coast of Ireland. Or had fun with the Dutch. Mm -hmm. See, so I read Economist once, and he explained how the annual treasure fleet to Spain ruined the economy of the Spanish Empire. Lots of wealthy nobles were their foreign goods. Pretty much, so they don't invest in Spain itself. I would say the Spanish Empire ruined Spain in many ways. Um... Paul Johnson, are you committing sacrilege? Seven up, not iron brew. Unfortunately... I'm all out of iron brew, and when I tried to order some to be delivered today, none of the places were stocking it, so 7-Up was the only option. It's not the same, but it's better than nothing. And it was either that or live off water, and frankly, today I, I need the energy. Perhaps that's why it is not working, though, because the gods aren't pleased because I'm not drinking iron brew. That could be it. Oh, Richard, I thought it was the English Navy till 1660 when Charles II renamed it. It was, let's put it this way, it's called the Royal Fleet, which are the ships which are owned by the Crown. But they are combined with ships which are owned by various other personnel to become the English Navy. So, quite a large chunk of the English Navy in the Armada is not owned by the monarch. It's owned by the, it's owned by some trading companies, some livery companies that is, and some by private individuals. Hmm. In hi Jeff. In happy, do you think that some of the Hadrianerican glazes? I think I've answered that one. Uh, Frederick Vierka, that's quite confident. A lot more than I thought. It is pretty much. And then let's look at the other traditional thing. How often do we hear about the 4,000 troops at Tilsbury? The brave army, the sole thing the English could put up to mount uh, to fight a massive army of 60,000 or whatever is coming. For starters, why is Palmer going to bring his whole army with him? 
Okay, maybe Philip II thought he was going to bring his whole army, but we've already established that Philip was not really a logistics genius. In the case of Duke de Palma, he's probably planning on build, bringing between twelve and 18,000 of his troops. That'd be how many I'd be expecting to move. And honestly, that leaves him with a bit of a manoeuvre army back in the Netherlands to deal with the Dutch. Because the Dutch are annoying. They're doing all sorts of things. There's no, the Dutch aren't stopping fighting the Spanish just because the Spanish want to go invade the English. In fact, for the Dutch, stopping the Spanish invading the English is just as important as for the English stopping the Spanish invading the English. Because the Dutch have no defensive depth. Their defensive depth, their logistics depth is England. England is their security blanket at this time. They need it. Jeffila, what was the Spanish plan to invade England after their forces linked up? Where to land? How? Where to go off landing? Their planning to land was either along the south coast or the Thames Estuary. Thames Estuary would be more problematic, which is why you have the 4,000 militia gathered at Tilsbury. Okay? So they gather 4,000 troops at Tilsbury. They have more forming up back in London. They have more, but as the Queen mobilises the 4,000 to Tilsbury, which means they go on to the royal cost. If she leaves the trained bands in the sink ports, in the various counties and in London, forming up but staying there for the moment, she doesn't have to pay for them. And also that means they're not all concentrated in the wrong place. That means you can concentrate them where you need them, wherever the... Spanish land, you can concentrate them. You need to put the 4,000 troops at Tilsbury, though, to stop a rapid rush down to London. Because that basically reinforces the Tilsbury area and stops it being really possible for the Spanish to charge down into London. If they can't do that, then they can't, the chance of a coup de foudre is over. Seth Wilson, the gold from South America caused massive inflation devaluing all European currencies. Yep. In Happy, do you think that the narrow hulled galleons had their gun ports staggered to mount the long guns plus carriages? Seen this theory. Um, there is certainly some suggestion of this. I think there's also the fact that. They weren't built quite as we'd understand it with sol uh, sometimes always decks the whole way along. Um, they were built certain sort of stuff crammed in, and some of these ships were adapted even while construction, let alone after construction. So, um, yeah, guns are interesting. We're going to get onto the cannon in a bit. Uh, Ken McGuire, well, you can argue about how much Spain existed as a unified nation time, it didn't. It's a group of bureaucracies competing, and often competing with their theoretical king. Mm -hmm. Stashik? Uh, Hello? Off topic. Just listen to Bill Trumps, where you discuss possible plots... For good naval movies. Actually, there is a six-episode Russian t TV series, Convoy PQ-17, made in 2004. Cool. Have to look it up. In Happy. The English didn't pursue the Spanish way far to, very far to north. Their ships and crews were also clapped out. Yes, but also they didn't need to. And they knew how bad the seas were up there. Um, they weren't so much clapped out at this point. <sighs> it's going to sound strange. They weren't clapped out. They had a couple, a few more days in them and they managed to get them home. And the idea Howard had would that he be immediately resupplied and would head off to round the south coast. His plan was to go round the south coast, come up through out of the Irish Sea, and he reckoned he would beat the Armada round. And you can actually see why he might think that.
Can't forget what the post just posted. They got my package of canned iron brew. It's terrible. Uh, sometimes look like, so the race, uh, race builds and rasates were the battle cruiser that day. To an extent, they're the fast crew. They're certainly that's coming up with a similar idea. Paul Gatron, I love the idea of a constantly mutinous army responsible for fortifying the Spanish Netherlands somehow landing its entire force in England. Yeah, that's the other problem. They weren't paid that often. I'm not sure how loyal they'd have been. Jeff Beeler, where does the British 4 for 8 Galiza's Tiger in 1546 converted to Galleon in 1570 fit into the evolution of Galleon? Um, honestly, it's it's there, but I, I, I don't want to get too much into that evolution. The evolution of Galleon is weird as anything. I would s The Galleon sort of evolves, I would say, more from the Carrack and the Caravelle than it does from the Galleases. But lots of galleases get turned into galleons. And then the galleon, via what I would call the race galleon, turns into what we would call the ship of the line, slowly. Why don't we hear about the 1589 English counter armada with 23,375 men and 150 ships under Sir Franz Drake? Forty ships, uh, ships sunk or captured, again thousands killed, wounded or captured. Total failure. Well, I can talk about that, but that's not today's topic. But I will talk about it at some point in the future. Uh, the whole point I'm trying to make today is that the Spanish Armada was important. It was important for the national myth of the United Kingdom, but I. And certainly there was a level of fear about it if they had been successful. But there's a lot of reasons why I didn't don't think they would have been. And that's I know that's easy for me to say several hundred years later. And uh, but I think that in nicest way, there wasn't really the support in England for Spanish rule, even if it was Catholic, there wasn't really the love of Catholicism in England in enough of the majority to support it. And it's who's made monarch if you don't have Elizabeth I. And that would have called, reopened an entire can of worms, which I don't think Philip II or his particular group around him, his court understood the can of worms that would come from the English succession fight which he would have got sucked into King's Rook Argent is Latin for silver, Argentinian basically means land of silver, Argentinian huge silver reserves that Spain mined heavily yep Steffi Wilson, her grace queen Elizabeth tried to make sure the troops were paid. Yeah. Well, yes, but she was slow to pay them for the reasons that she didn't want them demobilizing. She did, it wasn't uh, the idea that's often put around is that she didn't pay them because she wanted them to die off so to save her money. That wasn't the case. It was more a case of she didn't want to demobilize them because she didn't know where the Spanish Armada was. There was always the chance that they put into some Scottish harbour, reformed, and managed to come back again. She should have supplied better food, though, to, to, if she's uh, if that's really a massive what uh, if that was her reasoning. She didn't seem to understand that they needed food. Um, Frederick Vega, basically the Armada was not as good as it was portrayed to be, and English weren't as def defenseless as it seemed. No. The interesting thing is the militias, you know. you When you find out that York has a pretty much, well, not a standing army of 12,000 troops, but 
pretty much an on-call reserve army of 12,000. York. Newcastle. Lancaster. Durham. All have their own forces. Southampton. If you go down... One of the early ideas with the Armada that they have, uh, you know, as they're going to poor, and I do say poor, poor um, Medina Sidonia has to shoot down, is the idea of a storming Plymouth. Now, A, there are a whole load of Royal, of English fleet warships sitting in there. B, it's got fortifications. C, it has quite a large number of ground troops. And D, yes, you're carrying 18,000 soldiers, but have, do you want to carry out an amphibious assault straight into Plymouth? Because if you consider where the beaches are that are practical for you to get in close enough to actually land something, A, they're all covered by fire, and B, you're going to have troops turning up before you even get enough men ashore. You're going to have to row your boats in. It's a good way to get a load of people killed. Um, Carl Gasmuth, noble metal inflation. Back in the day, we just had uh, we joked about A, D, and D uh, first. Ed. That plate mail went uh, weight more in steel than its price in gold coins. Hmm, interesting. So it was English Catholics were English first, Catholic second, particularly after Mary's reign. Yes, that was the trouble. She and unfortunately Philip had been her husband, which meant none many of them were not a particularly big fans of Philip. Jeff Beeler, how did the Isle of Wight figure into the Spanish plans? Well, they had this lovely idea that they would dock, they would uh, anchor in the sort of Solent area off the Isle of Wight and shelter there until the Duke de Palma was ready to cross, and then they'd go down to cross them. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a feeling that, A, the, the ladies and gentlemen of the Isle of Wight might have had something to say about that. Fairly sure most of the residents of Hampshire would have had something to say about that. And it doesn't seem to me that stable a position to anchor yourself there. You either anchor it and start putting in troops, in which case your troops are going to start getting involved in a ground fight with the English ashore, in which case you're not either going to have to be able to leave them to go collect Palmer, or now Palmer's on his own and you're stuck supporting troops who are fighting ashore, or you keep them all on the ships and you're sitting on ships off the coast and the English are just going to be turning up, blasting at you and going away and coming back. They're basically, they'll be doing a running thing of going into Portsmouth, Rearming, coming out, firing all their guns and until they're running out of ammunition, then going back into Portsmouth. And you'll just be anchored there going, we hate you. You're blasting us and we cannot do anything about it because our guns fire so slowly. Paul Johnson, how does clock, how are trustworthy was the North? Still quite high numbers of Catholics, especially in Yorkshire. Let's put it this way. You have two reasons why the North isn't as worrying as you would think. A, the Wars of the Roses had ended up with the Tudors, which had led to Elizabeth York marrying Henry VII, Henry Tudor. And that meant that the two Roses, the York, the Lancastrian and the York Rose combined and became the Tudor Rose, which Queen Elizabeth was the last descendant of. Last Tudor Rose. The trouble is the other option, if you're looking for another Tudor a Tudor descendant, you would probably be looking up at James VI of Scotland. The trouble is he's a young boy and Philip wouldn't be put in wanting to put him in his in, in Elizabeth's place. So you know Philip would be trying to impose someone else and that would just not be as popular. Also, Mary had killed off a lot of Protestants, yes. But she had done it in a way which had made a lot of Catholics very uneasy. Elizabeth was less worried about chasing down Catholics. 
Um, it really did. She preferred that they weren't Catholic, but she wasn't going to spend too much time tracking them down as long as they didn't actively plot against her. So, they had time. Angus Lennon, I feel that Dr. Clark's girlfriend is going to give him a, a talking to about that accent. She is going to tell me off about many of my accents. Uh, Bitchin, Postman just dropped off to me Commodore Clatsbrook and Phoebe's Assault Falkland, San Carlos Water. Enjoy. That accent was terrible. Yep. So, uh, Bitchin, in fact, so what about the making the Isle of Wight as a Gibraltar by the Spaniards? We will never return that. Um, there is one small problem with that. And I can see that it, the Spanish actually doing it. If the Spanish want to land, A, the Isle of Wight is not going to be quick to fall because there are quite a lot of fortifications on it. B, the thing about Gibraltar is as annoying as it is to the Spanish, it isn't actually near anything major to support the attacks. For the English, Gibraltar, the Isle of Wight is right on top of Portsmouth and Southampton. In other words, they can have troops, they can have ships, and they can keep supplies going constantly because there are existing supply networks sitting there to supply those two beach, uh, those two things to keep sending out ships and troops. And it would turn into a holy war. All the Protestant troops would be all. It basically, it would be all the Protestants versus the Catholic Spanish, and quite a lot of the Catholic English because they wouldn't like Philip coming back. So. It would combine the English quite well, and you'd have a large army ending up landing down there. As long as the siege went on, you would then find the Spanish forces. And again, the problem comes with they're supposed to be linking up the Duke of Parma. They're supposed to be linking up the Duke of Parma. So if you do all those things, that's one that they can probably do those initially. But they only have 18,000 troops initially. You have 18,000 troops. If the English get together an army of 20, 30,000, Leicester is fairly decent. He can probably beat you with those odds on his side. Frederica Vega. That's what I remembered from history class about Elizabeth. She was liked that she didn't start a Catholic, she had didn't start a Catholic purge. No. That was her sensible little trick. Good evening, Eric. That's something. Awesome. Very good chat, first of all. I'm listening closely. I'm glad. Paul Sonson. Uh, were the Plantagenets an option for, for monarch after Elizabeth instead of the Stuarts, or were they still Catholic? They were still Catholic and not really liked by the various nobility. Plantagenets weren't remembered fondly. Stephanie Wilson, Vega, 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 Elizabeth had start inherited a kingdom that had suffered successive purges and set about reuniting countries. She was charming and did well. She gave England stability. That is certainly the put uh, the aura she puts forward. Mostly, what she did was she established the rule of law. I yes, you could still be burnt at stake. She did burn more people at the stake than Mary did. But the thing is, those people who burned at stake were all proved to have been doing something nasty and plotting something at her. Which is the thing. Mary was prepared to burn someone at stake just because of their religion. Elizabeth preferred not to bother so much about that. She'd more worry about it if you were actually up to something. If you're plotting against her, she'd do it. Um... So anyway, bigger war in the future. Hundred Year War, so the Armada was largely a prelude for the upcoming European War, by my count. The real First World War. Well, two men, Walsingham and Cecil, helped her a lot. That they did. And hence, I put them in here. If you remember from, I think they're in part one. I have Walsingham, I have Cecil, and I explain about them. Because, again, there are far more people involved, in a way, on the English side than on the Spanish side and the command structure. 
because once you're operating that far from home, Prince Philip's made his orders. The court has had an input, but the moment the Medina Sidonia is in the Bay of Biscay and heading north, he's well beyond their input. They can't do anything. Gordon Collins, would the Spanish have put young James on the thrones? He wasn't exactly Catholic. I also don't think the Scots would be too happy about having a large Spanish Catholic army in England anyway. No and no. And that is another reason. Uh, young James was a Protestant. His ministers were all Protestant. And you could guarantee a Scottish army would probably have possibly... It's going to sound terrible to say. But a Scottish army might have come south to help if the Spanish had got a foothold in the Isle of Wight. Because remember... As long as Queen Elizabeth reigned and didn't get married, James was her heir. And that had been established pretty much after Queen Mary was... So, Mary, Queen of Scots, that is. So... That's the reality. You know, that's what's going on. That's what they're thinking about. These are real issues they've got to worry about in terms of if you put your troops ashore, what are you going to end up facing? Are you going to end up facing a Engl combined English and Scottish army? Possibly. It might not be a Scottish Scottish army. It might be some lords come south. But either way, it, you could end up facing a large body of well-trained, very experienced soldiery. There's also... And this is going to sound terrible again. The French, who are a Catholic power, yes. But do they really want the Spanish to gain control of England in their north? They have enough trouble with Spain, Spain and the Netherlands. And they're fighting the Dutch there. Do they really want them in England? Kevin McGuire, the impression I got is that while there were a few who wanted other offshoots of the plat from the Plantagenets in Henry the Seventh's day, my family Elizabeth, next no one wanted to open that can of worms. No, uh, it is a can of worms. Succession in the English throne is a can of, can of worms of heart. The Scots, any reason that it's Angus of Summer, Scots, any reason to go visit York is a fine, fine thing. Yes, this is why the, that's why York has 12,000 troops. RF4, as alluring as a chastised and or Catholic England may have been, in reality, England probably would have become another Netherlands that the Spanish could ill afford. Yep. That's pretty much it. Which is often the thing I look at when I look at the Armada and what Spain was doing. Yes, you were annoyed with the English behaving and doing what they were doing with the Dutch. But maybe if you weren't plotting, kept, didn't keep um, giving succor to people trying to kill her, then Elizabeth probably wouldn't have helped out the Dutch so much. And maybe if instead of sending the Armada, you'd have signed a peace deal with her, you'd have had a far easier time because it would have been her job to keep her privateers in line rather than yours. And let's be honest, which is more expensive? To try and fight a war versus the English and keep and pretend uh, and all your colonies and things from their attacks, or to agree a peace deal and make it illegal for them to do it. Gone cons. The French would then be encircled, uh, then encircled by the Habsburgs. I don't think they would have let, let that happen too easily. I don't think so. And remember, the French are the old allies for the Scottish. So if the Scots end up fighting the Spanish because of that, then the French might be able to say, we're coming in to aid our Scottish brethren or something like that. There's lots of different reasons. It's, it's one of those scenarios where, good or bad, it doesn't work out well for the Spanish. It just doesn't. And I'm just going to check the battery on the phone. Right, and the battery on the phone is at 29%, so... 
Hopefully that holds up. Hopefully that holds up. But if it doesn't, it'll beep at me and then I will just have to finish this early. Angus Sano, the geopolitics of this sounds more and more like those of Sengoku Jedi. Yes, it does. And honestly, there is a reason for that. We like to try and present history as being easy and straightforward. It isn't. The joy of the Spanish Armada is it's nowhere near straightforward. The Spanish strategy is to sail to Netherlands, link up the Duke of Parma's army, escort combined force across the Channel, land even in Thames Estuary South Coast, and conquer at least curb Elizabeth's power. Um, especially interesting are some of the state papers around about this. And the fact is they've been translated into English, so are nice and easy to read. And... I look. I listen to that strategy, and I think, well, actually, the only option out of that which is mo remotely good and remotely viable from the Spanish is the moment they land their troops, Elizabeth immediately capitulates. Why would she? Because if you capitulate immediately after the Spanish land, you look so weak; they are going to demand more than you want to give. So you're going to have to fight them. And if you're going to have to fight them, that means you're going to have to gather your armies. And if you're gathering your armies, you might as well go fight them with the intention of winning. So, Thompson, Dog Club. Every empire civilization has an end date, mostly around 250 years. The Ottomans had their turn, then the Spanish, Britain, America. Who's next? Hmm. I will say this, it's not usually the nation everyone thinks it's going to be as next. There are lots of options. And also, I think... I think sometimes you can get wrapped up in the concept of a formal empire versus an informal empire. And an informal empire can be so much more scary and larger and more powerful. And again, people can over talk, over egg the, the likelihood of demise. Emma, that plan is almost as complicated as some of the IJN plans of World War II. It is, whereas the English plan is basically do not let the, the Spanish stop. And that works quite well. Azaski, what was the effect of the Armada fail for Spain in the longer term? Were they ever able to rebuild their fleet? And if yes, what uh, then? When then they? Uh, where did they have to cut? They did rebuild their fleet. They did attempt the Armada again a couple of times, uh, and. Yeah, it just, as Frederico Vega puts it, he, he tried three armadas and each one failed. Um, the Spanish have the money coming in from South America. And to be honest, the English are just constantly tracing that treasure fleet because they know Victor, uh, Spain's economy, without, if you take out one treasure fleet, that wipes out the economy for a year. It did. And that was the coming plan. Wipe out the economy for at least a year, and you've made it. Now, can someone explain to me why the stream from my phone is apparently excellent 
but the stream coming from the laptop over the same Wi-Fi was terrible. So terrible, it wouldn't work. No idea. Anyway, um... Jeff Miller, how is Medina Sidonia good at logistics? How do I put this politely? He inherited from Santa Cruz a mess. And Santa Cruz, that wasn't a mess of the Santa Cruz's creation. That was a mess of Philip II of Spain keep cutting money's creation. And Medina Sidonia basically starts off by organizing supplies. First thing he needs to do is work out where the troops are coming from, where the ships are coming from, and get them to work together. Then he needs to work out where the supplies are coming from. He needs to organize the supplies. He managed to completely restock most of the fleet, and this is after everything had been destroyed at Cadiz, in about six months. And that is, let's be honest, that's a freaking feat at that time. Not half bad, let's do it. Yeah, that was basically the English plan. It worked well. Old oh, Richard, how much did Hawkins, or much of Hawkins' organization in Monk and Peeps carry forward? Well, that's an interesting thing. You see, the thing about Hawkins was he instituted plans for ships, which had to be logged and filed. And detailed accounting of the of the navy and all the things, and checking wood was seasoned. Honestly, most of Peeps and Monk's reforms built on what Hawkins had left. Hawkins' reforms are pretty much what the fleet runs on for the next hundred odd years, which is quite scary to think about, really. That's how often the Royal Navy gets reformed, about every hundred or so years. Vision, at least your laptop is not exploding flames like in Star Trek. The bridge is smashed, the computers are doffable. Yeah, that, that'd be quite funny. Going on, how did the fleets at the time store fresh water in barrels? Literally, barrels of water, barrels of, barrels of alcohol were all trailed aboard. It was all stored in barrels. And this is the thing, it is the race-built galleys um, had a longer keel relative to the width of beam than their predecessors. And that was all they sort of, they're also, that's the really big thing that Hawkins does. He starts thinking about what ships are we building. Vision. I've seen plans of frigates from the 18th century designed to use oars as, sa as well as sails. How come was that in naval ships from Yamada up to Nelson? Uh, it's there because you could always get becalmed and you didn't want to necessarily be stopped. So having some more, the ability to use some oars tended to be quite a sensible addition. Jeff Beeler, how did the Hawkins sound nice Navy? Gun sizes, pay rates, stair rations? Uh, pay rates to an extent. Rations, he tried he centralised the ordering of to try and get the best deal, and it's such a mixture of guns. There is only so much you can standardise them, especially when several of those ships are bought by individuals. So he standardises on the guns, which are for remember he's only standardising for the Navy Royal. The ship's owned by the monarch. And it develops. And you're talking about a difference between 1588 and 1805. 217 years. A lot can happen in 217 years.
For a point, the Swedes and Russians used a lot of old sailing ships in the Baltic. Yeah, they did. South Thompson. Speaking of becoming becalmed, how come was it for gun crews to be put out into the boats and used as dope? Gun crews were sailors too. They'd go out into the boats. Galeases are definitely the far more common sail and ships, and they are very big in it in this period. What's also interesting is often talked about in technological terms is the cannon differential. Okay? Let's see. 1805. Yeah, pretty much. Virginia Vega, 20, 270 years we get from Nelson's, Nelson's ship to nearly having rail guns on ships. Yeah, pretty much the case. Uh, in 2022, we'll be as far away from the Battle of Trafalgar as the Battle of Trafalgar was from the Armada. That's got to be some sort of anniversary. It's fun to think about that. The other, of course, difference is between the gun carriages. And again, a lot more is made of this than necessarily sensible to do so. Um, for starters, the Spanish weren't being stupid when they did it. They had a reason for their most of their guns being mounted like their land carriages. They're planning to use them on land. Remember, most of these guns are part of the artillery train for the siege army and for the field army, which the armada is existing to land. Tommy. And then I can turn off. <sighs> Sorry, that light makes me incredibly hot. So I'm going to see if that is better and okay. Um, Paul Johnson, in less than 80 years after Trafalgar, turrets were heavier than the frigate. Yes, they were. See what? Also, War of 1812 be 200 years ago. Wooden broadside versus new ships versus nuclear carriers. Bigger jump next. 100 will be interesting. That we will. Frederick Vega. So the Armada's guns are the Army's guns temporarily on a ship for transport. Pretty much. They're being used mostly on their transport ships to provide firepower for the transport ships. Which is sensible. You know, okay, yes. They're not great for sea fighting, but that's not the point. It's a sensible way to carry your guns and carry as many guns as you can for the land fight. Take care, RF4. Come on, uh, we're on the verge of fusion power and flying cars for like 40 years. Yeah. Uh, what did the cannon shoot? Uh, the cannon shot iron balls. That's pretty much what they were shooting iron balls. Um, but honestly, the English, who were firing far more often and keeping firing far more, were ending up firing pretty much anything they could. Uh, they were at one point firing lengths of chain. Again, people go, well, that's silly. Do you know why are they firing lengths of chain? Well, if you think about some of the weapons used for taking out masts, actually firing lengths of chain is not silly. And also a length of chain flying through a, a deck of a, a deck of a soldiers massed on deck and these sort of things would kill off a lot of them so it was a very practical weaponry really 
Sam Thompson, Doug Clark. Equal time from Trafalgar to Armada. I believe that means the second coming of Drake or, uh, Drake or Nelson. Well, you know, if either me or Drac uh, end up in the Royal Navy in the next uh, couple of years, you might have an answer to your question. They were firing the chain into anything they could get hold of, and honestly, they didn't really sort of... The English were quite equal opportunities when it came to firing. They were quite happy to take out a vast majority of their enemy without too much trouble. King Zero. When Mistforces fired chains from cannon, they cut a pick in half in a very messy fashion. Youch. Yeah. And so on a Draken Fennel in the RN, I see him stationed at some of their larger dry docks. Yeah, I don't think he'd stay there for long. For anyway, I wouldn't like to be in the opposite side of a chain flying very fast. None of us would. So you might. Confederate tried a double barrel gun cannon with cannonballs connected by chain. Too dangerous to actually sink. I'm going to shoot one fired first and jerked the other out before it fired. Youch. So try that. Given the relatively light by Napoleonic standard gu standards guns, didn't the English have difficulties in actually sinking armada ships? They were causing damage, certainly, and casualties. Well, again, this is the point. Are you talking about them sinking ships as your metric for winning? They're causing a lot of damage to the ships, and they're forcing them to keep moving. It means that, A, they can't really break formation, and B, what Sedina and Medina Sidonia needs is time. He needs to be able to sail up the channel slowly to give time for the Duke of Parma to theoretically get ready. He needs to be going slow. He doesn't want to anchor because if he anchors, then fire ships can come in. And he knows about fire ships. The Dutch and English have been using fire ships before. He doesn't want to face them. So he ideally wants to go slowly up the channel. With the English coming up, keep firing, he can't go slowly. And that's the point. He can't outfight the English. They really can't outfight him, but they can force him to keep moving. And that's his problem. Because if he keeps moving, he eventually has to anchor. That's not good. That's downright terrible. Tom Gasman, Drax Naval Artillery video mentioned chain double balls, as well as Hungarian land history books of the period. Yeah, uh, it was something. It's, uh, there's bar and there's chain, which are different methods of trying to take out masts during the Napoleonic era wars, which is the chain, two ball, cannonballs combined to get linked together by a chain, both double loaded into a, uh, loaded into a single cannon and fired. It's... um. It's fun. So I've told I've had to dodge a chain once before. A tow truck went, a call went awry. Would rather not to have to try again. I, I, none of us would. Get very quick. Also, what are the English trying to do? Are they trying to sink, slowing them down, or drive them away? Drive them. If they damage them, that's fine as well. Because they're going to sound strange. Because of the way that they are working, if they damage them, then and they thought one falls back, then they can prey on it, and that's their plan. You know, they can take that, they can take that and capture it. But the more they can, the rest they want to drive the holes. So this is sort of two sort of stroke attack. It's a case of driving the enemy on, but also anything that falls out. Whew, it's, um, it's how wolves and lions and other pack hunting animals work. The pack is driving the herd, and when there's a weak one, 
And you keep driving them until there's a weak one. <laughs> Airman, since you mentioned them, what was the French reaction to the Yamada? Watching it closely. They didn't actually do anything, but they didn't exactly help either. In fact, by not helping the Spanish, they probably caught, they probably signed its death warrant as much as anything else. Because some would say that they could have had some safe spaces if it had been able, if they had been able to anchor in sort of some of France's bigger port areas, but they weren't able to. Gahan, would chain or canister shot be effective today for use against aircraft carriers? Well, canister, I'm not sure. It could be, but it depends how thick the hull is. Or you could clear the flight deck, definitely. As for chain, well, if you were shooting it at the antenna in Mars, it'd probably take them down again. Frederick Vega, so driving away in classically British uh, capturing or burning the week. Yep. It works. And of course, when the poor Spanish do actually find a place to anchor and anchor. The English send in the fire ships. And this is again the real fit, the interesting thing, because again, the fire ships are always said to, span it, uh, to panic the Spanish fleet and they do hurry away. They don't actually. Okay? The warships, the galleons, mostly hold their line, uh, ground. They know how to deal with fire ships. They have rowboats out pushing them, pulling them all away from their ships. They're fine. It's the other ships, it's the supply ships which disappear off, which panic. Gordon Connors, even if the guns on English ships are lighter, I would have thought that it would have countered by the Spanish ships also being small, and thus requiring less damage to put them out of action. That is basically the case. The amount of times I listen to people talking about the cannon for the Armada, and you you think they were talking about the difference between the English ships were all these little tiny ships, and the Spanish ships were all ships of the line. They weren't. Steam White, full set of seamanship comes in. Nighttime sailing okay for nighttime. Too many bumps out in the North Sea. In fact, I think King Philip said he didn't send the Armada to fight the elements. Whatever. What do you think of this? <sighs> Info addict, you're really setting me up to really roast Philip. Philip is okay. We talk a lot about bad leaders. We talk a lot about some crazy, stupid leaders in our time. Philip seems to be quite successful at certain points, but the thing is, I wonder to what extent he is sheltered by the Habsburg Empire. And so that makes him seem successful because he has so much money and power. And because how many people can really oppose him? It's kind of like the modern scenario at the moment. If anyone picks a fight with America, Donald Trump is going to win. Because there is no nation on earth at the moment which could stand up to America militarily. There are lots of nations which are auditioning for the role. But none which could actually do it right at this moment. And have a chance of winning. Right at this moment. On the August the 6th, 2020.
So anyone attacks him, he's going to win. But if he's in charge of organizing the things which are going out, and this is another thing, he's sort of insulated by the fact the sheer scale and organization of the bureaucracy below him. So he gives an order, and it's not him organizing, it's not him leading it. This is the trouble for Philip. It is him. It is him picking the leadership. It's him enforcing. To be honest, what I'd have been tempted to do was we take the senior admiral who was still alive after Santa Cruz died and ennoble him and say, you're in charge. But he couldn't do that. Because it wouldn't work in the Spanish system. So you have to send poor Medina Sidonia. And he's got to deal with Palmer. And managing Palmer is a full-time effort. It really is. And Philip's just not up to that task. Very starting. The French always had the Zions on the Spanish Netherlands. While they might not have wanted to overtly go against the Pope's blessing for the Armada, it wasn't in their interest to assist either. Yep. Um, in Appy, were the race-built gangs the first purpose-built warship, i.e. not more or less adapted from existing commercial designs in post-medieval Europe? You could certainly argue that, yes. You could definitely argue that. that uh, yeah, I would. They were, the race-built Galleons, I'd say, were the first purpose-built warships. Um, Galleons, possibly. But Galleons, they are adapted from the larger merchant ships which are being used by Neapolitan uh, Marine and the Venetian Marine. So, no. It wouldn't fit that criteria. Uh, Old Richard. How were the survivors of the Stormwreck Spanish ships received by the local Irish? Very friendly. Not. Uh, uh, they came ashore thinking as fellow Catholics they'd be well treated. Um, the Irish were very interested in their money. Uh, Golden Eagle. The Chinese have a saying for French attitude. Watch the fire from the opposite bank. It's the ninth strategy in the book of 36 strategy. Yes. Although I have to say, having read that book once a long time ago, uh, there are a lot of things in it which I look and go, hmm, that's pretty much the same thing as the previous one. Michael Rhodes. Hello, even though it's a bit late to see me, so it seems I have some catching up to. Uh, we had a lot of computer issues for about the first half hour to 45 minutes, so... Don't worry about that bit. Uh, Brock Payne. The Greek trains ought to be counted as purpose-built warships, Solly. Yes, but they're a lot earlier than post-medieval. And honestly, if I'm going to talk about those, I'm going to talk about Quinker Marines. Oh, and while I remember, the post is live on Patreon for people's suggestions for... What, uh, for um, next month's, for September's Patreon videos. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave it live till next Thursday. And then I'll put up the vote next Thursday. And that'll be live not till that Sunday, but till the following Sunday. Airmen, how much of the Spanish Navy was part of the Armada? Could they have drawn more ships from the Americas and from Mediterranean, even if ships from the Mediterranean aren't suited for the Atlantic? Yes, they could have done. Honestly, they had the trouble was they had commitments. They were dealing with the Ottomans. They were dealing with various issues with the Papal States. They had all sorts of problems in North Africa going on with the Moroccans and the Barbary pirates. Uh, they had issues in, they had to maintain a squadron in South America to defend their territories from, well, pretty much everyone else. The, the Spanish Armada was the most number of ships they could gather and send, but it really wasn't the full fleet. So, Thompson, the Irish are, the Irish are friendly as long as you're invited. Uninvited guests, not so much. Ah, yeah. Vision. Good comparison between King Philip and President Trump on the difference military leadership in 16th century Spain and modern professional military organization and command structure today. That's the thing. The modern structure insulates the leader a lot. 
that'd be great. The thing is, the thing with the book is that the original works are super basic, meant for people two thousand years ago, who really didn't have a clue on how to conduct war. Oh, so many. Uh, I, I always remember reading that, reading through my copy of Sun Tzu and thinking that this is very, very basic. And then afterwards thinking, who is this written for? It's written for a political class who really don't have the have a scooby what they are doing. That's the point. What is it in the land of the blind? The one-eyed man is king. Well, that's the case of Sun Tzu and the thirty-six stratagems. Which are different works from memory. Um, tell Thompson, tell my girlfriend if that was a good accent, please tell her. Um, <laughs> oh. Calm Gasbert, I guess I have to patronise her journey, the you know Adriatic. Oh, carry on. Okay, which is why people sometimes call it to stand the test of time, since it just lays out the most basic groundwork. That is usually a thing. Usually what stands the test of time is something which is very basic, which is good, because that hopefully shapes things as they go on. Uh, in Happy, did the Folio de Amada have any influence on Spanish Portuguese ship design? Not really. Eventually, it does have an effect on their gun decks and does start them putting in more guns, but it takes time for them to get out of the habit of building what they're already building. And that's the trouble. This is a small portion of the fleet, and most of it looks like it got beaten by the weather, and that's a good thing to say. See what? In the USA, it said the reason we won the Revolution the Union, won the Civil War, was the fact that we had more Irish than the other side. It could work. It could work. Thomas Rockman, given the degree of English repentance, was the Spanish Armada destined to fail, or could it have succeeded with a different strategy or leadership? It would have had more of a chance of Santa Cruz, but I don't really think it would have had much of a chance. Everything hinges on what happens in England the moment they land. And I don't see there being a popular uprising, a mass popular uprising of Catholic English, of, of Catholics. The, one of the things was they were taking hundreds of priests with them because they thought they would need to minister to the local population as the populations would all rise up against uh, the evil Protestant queen. And whilst I agree the English weren't probably as actively Protestant as other nations were, my reading of the time is that they were satisfied enough with the Elizabethan settlement that, frankly, they wouldn't have wanted change. And the thing is, under Mary and Philip, a lot of people's friends have been killed for thinking the wrong way. And you don't really think of them as your fr uh, 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 as a being a bad or good person. You think of them as your friend. So I don't think that that happens. So I think the militias, the trained bands, gather together. And I think there would be a very big battle if they landed. And therefore... I don't think you get the full army. I've seen ideas of going 56,000, all this number of troops. If Palmer brings his full field army, that's 30,000 if they're all well and all capable. And the Armada is another 18,000 if they're all well and all capable. So that's 48,000 troops, which is a large army. But that's if everyone comes and it's all well and all capable. That's not going to be fun to try and manoeuvre around England. Thank you. 
Especially because the English have learnt the lessons from the Dutch. They will be doing a guerrilla war for, uh, against you until you reach a point at which you have to lay siege. And you're going to have to make a point where you're laying siege to London. So in nicest way, you're going to have all the troops from the southeast, probably the southwest and the centre of the UK coming to and converging on London, which already has the most well-trained of the trained bands. It has the livery companies, who, by the way, had their leaderships and their their finances desecrated, the la decimated and desecrated the last time Philip was in power. So they are going to be highly motivated to spend whatever is necessary to make sure their troops are ready. Yeah, I, I don't see this as going well for the Spanish. It might do, but I don't see it. Frederick Vega, uh, Fred, Federico Vega. Also, when it thus settled, what was left of both the Armada and the English, aka losses, and also political ramifications? Well, the English didn't lose a single ship. In fact, they captured a few Spanish ones. So, theirs was a great victory, and building some more ships, and even bigger ones. Um, they're starting to get bigger and look even closer and closer to what would eventually become the rated ship systems. Basically, they're slowly merging into what will be called fourth rates. And fifth rates. Gordon Collins, could the Spanish even supply the whole army if it landed in England? Not easily, no. I, I doubt they could have had it done properly. Angus Sonna, if the Spanish had taken England, would they have plundered her for Philip's accounts? Probably. And that was the thing the English knew. The English merchant class and the English lords knew how poor Philip was. It was not something he had been able to hide because he had basically been, at the moment he married Mary, Queen, um, um, Queen, uh, Queen Mary, a little sort of sister, he had basically been hitting up the English for money. Um, either nicely or not so nicely. And all they had for it was lost Calais. They weren't happy. Carl McGasman, speaking of supply, how much land force is supposed to be living from the land? Well, again, the Spanish talk about them taking some supplies from them, but they also talk about them, the grateful crowds of English people freed from the uh, freed from the evils of Protestantism and Satan worship will supply us with food. Yeah, at sword point. Brock Payne, yay, my over desk shelf is up. And it didn't fall on my computer during installation. Huzzah for good Queen Bess. Good, good for you. Um, a book which I mentioned earlier in, I think it's in part two, but I want to bring up again. Vasco da Gama's book. Uh, this is a book about Vasco da Gama, The Life of Travels On. And he's one of those forgotten people, but he does quite a lot of very interesting stuff. You know, he reaches all sorts of places and does all sorts of fun things. So this is a really cool book, and I basically, I just wanted to show it to you. Sarah Thompson. Dr. Clark, yeah, Spanish dreams is the reason I have a P in the middle of my last name. Mm. There are lots of dreams they have. There are lots of ideas they have about what they're going to do. I'm just going to check the battery again on the phone. Okay, we're at 16% on the battery. So I am going to keep this going till about 9 o'clock, hopefully. But it's gonna. I'm going to stop at 9 o'clock because I have a feeling I'll run out of battery power then. Um, see, Mike, getting close to lunch here. Tackers and breeders again. I, I try, I'm tired of it. 
We'll trade for a Reuben sandwich. Trouble small towns, lack of variety. Ooch. To be honest, actually, I have to say, some of the small towns I've seen, mainly Cornish ones, have been really, really good. Now, summary. was an interesting one to talk about. And this is a this is why I'm glad I do the introductions because this means that even though I haven't been able to do the visuals I normally do with this video, you can go find them somewhere and listen to what I'm talking about. Uh, the Anglo-Portuguese alliance kicks off quite early on, but it gets abridged by the Spanish. Oh, Richard, had the English ships been using the more manoeuvrable gaff rig mizzen sail on the race belts, or did all ships present still use the lanteen mizzen? It's half and half. Some of them do seem to have, although they don't call it the gaff rigged mizzen, mizzen sail, um, some do seem to have the lanteen. And it's kind of interesting how fast the English ships are going because. At no point do they worry about catching up the Spanish. They just crank on sails and get, get forward for it. And again, this is the thing. If you're 55 ships versus 130, and let's be honest, you're often actually slightly more than that. You would expect the English to be adopting a very either overly aggressive attitude if they were that much weaker or overly defensive attitude. But instead, they're, they're adopting a very measured, in their form, operational tactic. They're not being overly aggressive. They're not, da da they're not taking any risk doing anything to try and succeed. And I think that shows the reality of the fleet they were facing in their scenario in terms of their own estimation. Which is good. It shows how well England had prepared for the coming threat. Paul Johnson, 1373 was the start of the alliance. I thought it might have been, but um, I always worry about getting that date wrong. Next year, by the way, Iron Brew is 120 years old, just to add that in. As we're talking about things being lasting a long time. There is a hefty amount of luck in it. You have to admit that. But... And one of the interesting things in, uh, that, I, uh, that I've often considered is, would the Spanish have been better served by bringing more Galizes with them? They needed... Uh, take care, Frederico Vega. Have a nice day. They needed Galizes with them, and they needed galleys with them because of fighting, to an extent, uh, because of getting the, fighting the Dutch to get the Duke of Parma's army out from the Dutch coast. But I also wonder if they had enough of them with them, they could proceed it at a slower pace because they could have, would have been more able to fight against the wind and push off the English attacks. But we'll never know. So, so I take it that means we'll be having a birthday special for Ambrew. Next year, maybe. Me and Drac might organise something for, 20, uh, for 2021. We'll at least be drinking a lot of it. <sighs> it's been an interesting old day. Anyway, so... If you'd had more Gellises, you might have had a better chance of getting his troops out, Duke of Palmer's troops out, but you still were well limited. 
So in the end, it comes down to, do you think it was luck or strategy? And the English strategy was very much to not allow the Spanish to settle, to rest, to organise. It was basically to prevent their OODA loop working by constantly making them have to react before they could coordinate. Just th don't take this the wrong way, but does anyone else think that the English strategy sounds very similar to Blitzkrieg? Move fast, move hard, move in such a way that your enemy can't react to you, that the uh, that your enemy can't start thinking they have to just keep reacting. Paul Johnson. Oh, old Richard, have fun, Richard. Doctor, I have to run. Take, doctor, take care. Thank you, old Richard. Um... Uh, Paul Johnson, was Philip the religious zealot he was made out to be? Well, that's hard to really assess. He certainly, in his pronouncements, he uses it as a cloak a lot. And in his letters, he does use it a lot. And, of course, that he does have a monastery palace. But, saying that as well, the Catholic religion, the church, was one of the few things he had which could bind his entire country together. That is the thing. Is he a religious zealot because he's passionate about religion? Or is he religious because he's passionate about keeping his country together and religion is the best vehicle he has for it? He's having to build up a national sense, a national identity. He's having to restore the nation after the wars against the Moriscos to get them out, to get back Spanish control as the way he marketed it over Spain. He's fighting everywhere in the whole of Europe to fight against the, uh, the various Islamic states and Protestants. Catholicism would seem to him to be a both of a useful binding tool and rallying tool, so being his most Catholic majesty probably works well for him. Is he really as religious as that? Well, he does ask Elizabeth for a hand in marriage, and he knows that she's not as Catholic as Mary is. Admittedly, maybe he thinks that would win it. Now, keep it a Catholic, but, you know, that's an interesting question. Kingsford, I'm pretty sure that the idea is mentioned by Sun Tzu. It's mentioned by everyone. It's been around as long as time. So why I find it funny when people start telling me, oh, the English fleet had no strategy. Yes, they had a strategy. They had the oldest strategy known to mankind. You can move so quick that your enemy can't do anything but keep reacting to you. So they can never get control of, the, uh, the control of the action. If you consider it's been the English strategy for a lot of history. Sam Thompson, uh, yeah, just a little bit. Didn't the Spanish uh, for the uh, try for the Shetlands or Faroe Islands just as na to nasty at that time, basically? You know, by the time you are coming through this, you're in the autumn storms, heading for the winter storms. They're going through. They're, they're going through in July, August. That's not nice weather to go. You're not getting. You're, you're going around the North England in September, October. No, 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 just not good. Broadbent, is there a reasonable outcome the Spanish count would have counted as a win, even if they didn't overthrow Elizabeth and conquer England? The English promising to stop invading, uh, stop causing trouble in South America and stop supporting the Dutch. That's pretty much it, but... The English really didn't consider that a likely outcome. They were negotiating. You have to remember, there were English ambassadors negotiating the Spanish right up until the Armada was sent, trying to find a peace treaty on both sides. 
that was satisfy uh, satisfactory to both sides. And in the end, Philip was so infused because of what Santa Cruz had said and because of the way the reports from Medina Sidonia were being filtered. He wasn't listening. And he was the Duke of Palmer, honestly. So anyway, forgot that Spain is a group of kingdoms with Bars, Barcelonians, Castilians, Aragons, plus many others. <coughs> Don't forget Navarre, that's even more fun. Um, no, not Blitzkrieg, more guerrilla attack. Attack off them, don't stick around, then attack again. Constant harassment. It's the same basis as Blitzkrieg, which again is based on using speed to overwhelm your enemy. Because you stop your enemy being able to think and they're just reacting to you. And they get into a cycle of retreating, 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 and retreating until they've lost their effect. Angus the Sonot. A truly venerable strategy that always seems to be in fashion. Get them. Yep. And it works. Carmel Gasman. Actually, harassing the enemy to death was the older idea which the ancient Greek city-states exchanged for the decisive battle method. Yeah. yeah. Jeff Hiller. Who was allowed to trade the Castilian-American Empire? Mainly only the Castilians. And that was one of the major troubles, because Philip had a habit of using Castilian troops as his garrisons in other parts of his kingdoms, or rather, his kingdom of Spain. And uh, that caused issues, because they weren't always the best garrison troops. Take care, Paul. So you might read your battle little part, hit the weak spot, hit for hard, fast, and often. Yep. All these things come back to a similar idea. Thank you, Paul. Take care. Um, it's the idea is that you're going to keep the enemy back, uh, force the enemy back. You're going to force the enemy to be on the back foot and not able to cope with you, and that's what they're after. It's rather fun, though. It is really rather fun. Right, then. It's the last 18 or so minutes. So any questions? Any things I haven't covered? And I would also add, Aerofing is pretty much a legacy of, to an extent, I would say more of Henry VII than Henry VIII. Because Henry VII is the one who set up all the things in motion, the bureaucracies and the centralization. Because after the Wars of the Roses, the great advantage has is he could be very centralizing. Which is what secured the Tudor monarchy for the time it was in power. Centralization Henry VII had achieved, which allowed all these things to be built up and allowed, really, in many ways, Queen Elizabeth was the far more powerful monarch than Philip II because she could organize for it what she said would largely happen. Whereas Philip would say something and then one of the local bureaucracies would say, No, no, you can't do that because. It can amount our ancient rights on this, 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 this. And Philip be going, oh, for fuck. I hate you all. Vision, Marva enjoys listening to you. I'm glad your mum does. Very nice that she does. Hang on, What would Spain have done with the Armada after England, assuming I was still intact and England secured? Uh, probably use them on the Netherlands to do a blockade on the Netherlands. If there's anything left. Um, Carl Gaffer, how, how are the opposing fleets communicated with their own and with the opposition? 
Um, it was by lights that they were uh, basically some form of flag signals and lights being used to follow them and loud hailers and shouting at each other and all these things. And when we're communicating the opposition, it's usually by letter. Kim McGuire, well, that whole centralization thing was a key reason Henry VIII broke with Rome. Yes, because the last part of the thing which they hadn't really managed to centralize was the uh, church. Lots of, there are lots of methods of communicating. It doesn't really work sometimes with your opponents, but it does work with your own people to sort of bang drums. Use signalling flags, lamps, trumpets, all sorts of noisy things can be done to make noisy things. Pre-arranged signals. It's not a Pakenham signal case, a signal book, but it is. There are signals going on, and again, this has been part of the Hawkins and Howard Effingham reforms. Jeff Mueller, saying Philip had an empire is like saying Queen Elizabeth was Queen of Ireland. In theory, yes. In practice, not so much. Yeah. I would say more that Philip had an... Uh, no, I would say Philip does, does have an empire. Just having an organised empire it, 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 it is a different matter. Whereas Elizabeth with uh, Queen of Ireland... Well, she has the Duke of Ormond. As long as the Duke of Ormond is doing what he's told, it's okay. When he isn't, then there's a problem going on. Thomas Ryan, what would the English ships have done if the Armada had land in England? Come ashore to fight on land or stay at sea and cut off supplies and communications to Spain, Northern Spain? That is an interesting question. Um, probably would have done some fire ship attacks on the beachhead. That's another reason they have fire ships ready there. Because, you know, if you think about it, if your ships are in one place offloading troops, fire ships are going to be a very big problem for them coming in and it's going to break them up and anything you can do to break up a delayed landing buys more time for the troops ashore to mass unless of course they attack Plymouth in which case they would have found them all sitting there waiting them with their guns out next to the shore battery guns just wouldn't have been fun that was right, what would the advance of that one um, see what just guessing. Remember reading USNI learning flag signals from the US Army. You were right though, Stephen. Jeff Hitler, did the English have any more fire ships? Yes, they did. What they were using as fire ships were small water, small ships which were old, uh, small old ships. So they were basically working from the oldest, smallest ship up. Ideally, they had probably about another 20 or so they could go. It costs money, but they're prepared to use them. What type of ships made it back to Spain? That's an interesting question, Jeff. Pretty much all the ships which survived, you know, quite uh, all the uh, different types of ships made it back to Spain. Um, no type was more successful than the other. The Junkers were particularly had trouble, but they were lightly crewed. So that's always going to make things a bit more difficult. But um, yeah, they were. They're also a fair number of the galleons have trouble because, again, high winds. High seas, high centre of gravity, not good combination. You don't want it all being high. Yeah, I said it wasn't. The one the time team found, like I said, was a poor quality supply ship. I think it was an Unka. Uh, what was other known as a supply hulk. Tells you how, how good they were. 
Carl Gassman, and Jeff Miller, I guess as long as Japan had working airplanes in 1945, they had kamikazes. Kind of the same with English fireship. Yep. Neil Waddle, as an American, I am asking what may be an obvious question. Armada or Battle of Britain? Which is a bigger factor in national psyche? Ooh. For a long time, it would have been the Armada, followed by the Battle of Trafalgar. And then the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, the Battle of Britain has been massive post Second World War psyche. So I'd say in the modern psyche, it's probably the Battle of Britain. Uh, Britain. Um, but prior to that, the Armada was fairly massive. And still is there. It still is one of the part of the Foundation National Myths. Bernadotte, being uh, reading my segment, the Siemens Rules of the Road and Sound Signals are still used today. When ships are in sight or each other and manoeuvring, e.g. one blast on whistle means starboard. You have to be very careful and you have to be loud to make sure you don't tell people what you're doing at sea. See what? For me... Uh, See, Mike, formations of hundreds of ships so close together amaze me. Jordan was massive, but much spread out. So the Armada and the English fleet were of very dense groups. That they were. Same so Wilson, the Armada set the pattern. I don't, for national myths, I would say so. Yeah. So, Thompson, my apologies for not chatting more. I have been mixing concrete and filling cinder blocks. What wood were the frames made of for the English fleet at the time? Oak or furs? Oak. There's a reason why there's a lovely pub called the Sorry Oak in not far from where I live, uh, which I'm going to be taking Drac to at some point because it's got the Battle of Trafalgar all over the walls because they supplied oak in for pretty much from that area for pretty much every single ship in the Trafalgar. And so they have all their listed up around that. And it's really quite cool. Uh, Jeff Miller, when did crews stop going outside to reload ship's cannons? <sighs> Prior to Mary Rose. It's a long time ago. Uh, honestly, they... the northern ships, and I would say this, the nations which are in the Atlantic Ocean rather than the Mediterranean st are start to transition earlier. But again, all their ships are transitioned probably about the time of the Mary Rose by Henry uh, Henry VIII's reign, definitely. Um, Mediterranean ones take longer because, again, at Mediterranean, you don't need to worry about it so much. Count of Gasmo, see what? At Jutland, the two or three bigger ships displace more than the Armada, I guess. Well, considering some of the galleons on the Armadas on both sides could weigh up to a thousand tons, especially the Spanish ones. The English ones usually got up to about 600, 700 tons. Um, honestly? Probably, but it'll be a few of them. Ben Lord, as a Scot, the Armada really doesn't really feature. For us, it's more Bannock, Burn, Sterling Bridge, and Flodden, pre-active union for a founding myth. Agreed. But it's the kind of interesting what if is if the... What would James have done if the Spanish had landed? And I don't think James would have wanted to tolerate a Catholic Spanish army being in England. It would have been problematic for the Scots, especially to deal with on their own, because how long before that Spanish army marches north to look at Scotland, which is, of course, a Protestant country. So I think he would have had to, I think you would have had Scottish troops coming south. To help fight the Spanish. I really honestly think you would have had it. I don't know if they got there in time for the fight, but if they had, oh, that would have been a massive. So that's awesome. So when or did they stop using oak as much? Uh, as Stephanie has put it, when iron replaced wood, oak was oak was it for a long, long time. Use the big firs and the big part, uh, sort of the big trees like that. They often use some masts. It's for the wooden wall is made of English oak.
Ben Lorna, particularly as Scotland is a more anti-Catholic brand of Protestant as well, even if Stuarts weren't as well keen on it as populace. Yeah, basically he would have had a choice. He could either lead his troops south or his troops would have gone south. I think he'd want to lead himself because it would have confirmed him as, and he was pretty much Elizabeth's heir, apparent. Admittedly, whether Elizabeth would have liked him coming south is a completely different matter because it would have been, stolen her victory. If there had been a battle, a land battle, and it had been won and he was there, he would have got the credit for it. Not Elizabeth, because he was the king. Unless, of course, she decided to charge into battle on horseback or something like that, then she'd probably have got the credit for it. Pat W. Sounds like the English had a layer defence planned. The Spanish never broke the outer layer. Pretty much. Rob Payne. Oak is the woodworker's best friend. It's easy enough to work that it doesn't murder your tools, but it's survivable in the weather. Hmm. That is true. Oak is pretty nice. Pine is, of course, easier on tools. And 2LC, teak has more survival, but oak has everything. Yes, and you can repair oak quite easily, which is the other advantage of oak. And season it. Kevin go out. would Scotland pay for an army to do it unless things got desperate I think for James the sick considering he was having to deal with quite a lot of his lords having a large number of armed men it would keep them busy and provide them with enough glory for years let's be honest a huge battle against the Duke of Palmer's army oh that would be glory for anything he would, uh, he would face with two advantages. Either they die, in which case he wouldn't have to deal with them, or they would get a lot of glory and be very happy. And probably, let's be honest, then you would have had the follow-up English Armada, and you would have probably had the Scottish along for that as well. So it would have been even bigger, and even more well-armed and massive. It could have been a very interesting change in the transition from the, you know, the fact that England and Scotland get fused by um, by succession, an act of union, to England and Scotland become fused by war and fighting war alongside each other. Hmm. So, Thompson, no, thank you. Stuff uh, Clark, Stephanie Wilson, thank you. Was he asking because I'm looking at wooded properties within the next five years and was planning on using my own wood for the house. Which would be best in your mind? Oh. Well, you see, the thing is, um, a pine log cabin is probably cheaper than an oak one because oak takes so much longer to, uh, longer to um, grow. But honestly, Oak is rather beautiful. So, you know, I would probably, I, I, I'd want oak, but I might well settle for pine with some very nice walnut desking, etc. Jeff Peter, collateral damage of the Armada was the failure of the Roanoke colony. New England style settlers in the south, uh, things would have been different. Yeah, honestly, if if it hadn't been for the Armada, they would have been able to send out more ships and they would have been able to probably resupply the Roanoke colony. But we also, we don't know what happened to the Roanoke colony to this day. They disappear. We haven't found their bodies. We haven't found anything that we don't know what happened to the Roanoke colony. It's the Mary Celeste of colonies. Carmen, what would be the incentive for Scotland to be involved in war? Basically, the problem is, if there is a Spanish army in England, how long before it comes north into Scotland? Where would you prefer to fight the Spanish army? In the Scottish lowlands or in the in England? That's the question. 
where would you prefer to fight the Spanish army? Because you're a Protestant power. You're a Protestant nation. You're a small Protestant nation. They're, you're dealing with the most Catholic majesty. If they take out England, which is the larger and one of, uh, arguably the largest, most homogenous Protestant nation there is, how long before they come for you? It's the same reason why the Dutch went hell for leather at Palmer. The Dutch basically doing the... 1588 version of the Battle of the Somme, where the English, British army literally were bleeding to try and draw the Germans away from Verdun, where they were destroying the French, so the French could hold Verdun. That is what the Dutch are doing versus Palmer's army. It's the same scenario as if the army man, managed to land, and actually you managed to land Palmer's army and the army from the Spanish the Armada in England. The Scottish have to deal with that threat. That's a going to be a big threat for them. So that's on Brock Payne. There's a lot of pine houses around. I grew up wanting. I grew up in one. Wanted something different. Oak. You can. It would be more expensive, but oak will be nice. See, right, steel frames on houses as U.S. Eastern coasts help defy the termites. Still, pine, uh, still pine furring ships on steel. Come, I, I thought Scotland was Catholic from what I was taught in school. In school. No. It. How do I put it? Scotland at this time is not. Mary Queen of Scots was Catholic. Scotland was not. Mary Queen of Scots grew up in France and grew up Catholic. Scotland was Calvinist to its core at this point. Okay, my guy. Well, Sweden had just shown they were a power in the Thirty Years' War. Yes, they had, but it's going to sound strange. As much as that's as good for Sweden, that's Sweden. They're doing quite well for up there in the north. It, it, in Scotland isn't so much concentrating on Sweden. It's they're concentrating on their area. The Swedes aren't going to come to the certain protection of Scotland. England is their buffer zone. Uh, the Dutch armies uh, had both. The Dutch army had both Scottish and English staff units. The Buffs and the Scottish Brigade. Yep, Jeffy. Uh, Gordon Collins, uh, Carmen. They were becoming quite strict Protestants this time. Just look up John Knox. Ah, uh, yes, that is an interesting gentleman. I actually, we used to have an insurance broker who was called John Knox, and it used to confuse me because this person from history was this, you know, staunch Protestant, this good, you know, everything like. And then there's John Knotts, our insurance broker, who was a is a lovely was a lovely guy. I think he's still alive, so he's a lovely guy. But um, definitely far more um, far more on the uh, enjoying life scare side of things than John Knox, his namesake was. Ben Lord, Scotland fought the bishops' wars with England because they felt English Protestant was too papist and wanted rid of their their bishops. That have been reimposed. Uh, that have been re been reimposed by the Stuarts. Yeah. Then Freeman. Yeah, amazingly, Scotland never went to church. In yes, I know the main bit of the Civil War. More of few kingdoms was uh, this sort of issue. Yeah. Yeah, but only Highland Scotland was Catholic this time. The cities were Protestant, and I don't even think Highland Scotland was that Catholic. Highland Scotland is a sort of Catholic, which is, yes, we're Catholic, but do we have to go to war with someone over this? We want to go to war over lots of things, and frankly, going to war with our Protestant neighbours, that is not much money. Going to war with the Spanish, that's a lot of money. Right. I'll keep this going another roughly 
five or so minutes and then I'm going to turn it off because I think my phone is about to die. Yeah, my phone is actually is about to die. It's on 2% battery. So, my phone is on 2% battery. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this name there and say thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. And answer off the initial questions to say thank you very much. Please do like and subscribe as always. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> Danny Freeman, we aren't going to order Spanish. We are going to order Spanish gold can chips. Bingo. Don't worry about being late. All right, then. It's all fine. I, I was asking. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a nice evening. As I said, the battery is dying on the phone. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed. And apologies, this isn't the usual standards. Um, but, you know, I will have a conversation with my laptop and find out what went wrong. Why it wasn't working. I'm not sure why. The internet, it was all working on the computers then. It wasn't working on the internet to YouTube for some reason. No idea why. Anyway, take care, everyone. Thank you. And take care. Thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you, Jack Ray. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.